Bom dia. É, Bem-vindos a essa mesa redonda padrões e boas práticas para a integração da sustentabilidade em investimentos. Eu gostaria de agradecer aqui a Maria e a Vasco é, pela, e, e todos que nos acompanham hoje para o que acho que vai ser realmente uma mesa redonda muito interessante. Estamos muito empolgados aqui. É, primeiro vou apresentar brevemente a pessoal que, que, que vai estar na, na mesa redonda em si. Né? Temos a Nicolás Faf, da International Capital Markets Association, ICMA. Temos a Stacy Coleman, da Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. Temos a Arturo Rodrigues, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, SASB. Temos a Marcelo Serafim, da United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, PRI. E temos a Glaucia Terreio, da Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, aqui no Brasil. Então, é, isso aqui é nosso terceiro evento e último evento dessa semana da World Investor Week 2020. E é, tem sido uma semana muito rica. Nos é, dois primeiros webinars falamos de tendências internacionais e nacionais das emissões de títulos temáticos. Estamos então, falando também da capacidade desses títulos para canalizar recursos para uma área tão importante como a recuperação econômica do Brasil, que é a infraestrutura mesmo, né, como, como a alavanca. E as gravações desses, desse evento, desses dois eventos, estão é, disponíveis no site do, do BID. E eu convido a todos que têm interesse neles, que, que visita e, e que vão, vai ser aqui, o link vai ser compartilhado no chat dessa reunião aqui, que tem sido é, conversas muito interessantes, muito é, 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 profess... é, pontuais com relação aos temas que, que eu mencionei. Hoje, vamos abordar aspectos mais práticos de, dessas emissões. Princípios, padrões, boa governança e divulgações dos impactos positivos, que são temas muito relevantes. Deduzimos que a grande maioria dos que estão aqui nesse evento não tem dúvidas de que os títulos temáticos são um mecanismo estratégico e útil para promover e, ao mesmo tempo, crescimento econômico e os benefícios sociais e ambientais. Desculpa, esqueci mencionar. Temos interpretação lá embaixo. Tem um globinho lá, que se vocês quiserem ouvir em inglês, podem colocar lá. For those that need interpretation, please note that, that at the bottom of the screen, there is a, a, a circle that allows you to hear uh, switch languages, to toggle between English and Portuguese. Uh, no, no início do desenvolvimento desse mercado, na década lá, na década de 2000, era preciso ainda convencer investidores e emissores da relevância e até da pertinência desses papéis. Hoje, já é um mercado com 800 bilhões de dólares em green bonds ao redor do mundo. Sabemos que a missão de títulos temáticos, bem como a incorporação da sustentabilidade em geral dos projetos, torna esses projetos mais resilientes a mudanças climáticas e outros impactos ambientais, mas também gera benefícios reputacionais para o emissor e para o investidor, além do que estimula a adesão de boas práticas de governança e transparência. Então, eu acho que ninguém tem que ser convencido mais dessas coisas. É por isso, são atrativos e úteis para ajudar a superar as lacunas de investimento no Brasil. Nós enorgulhamos de fazer parte dessa história, já que estamos presentes em ao menos 20% das emissões de, dos papéis é, temáticos na América Latina e no Caribe. No Brasil, temos diversas ações para impulsionar as finanças sustentáveis, incluindo promoção de diálogo público-privado do setor financeiro, com o desenvolvimento do mercado local por meio do Laboratório de Inovação Financeira, o LAB. Apoio a vários emissores na estruturação de seus títulos temáticos. Posso mencionar aqui o Banco ABC, que foi uma emissão comprada pelo BID, também o BDMG com o Framework e outros que estão em processo de, de é, aperfeiçoamento para, para serem entregues ao mercado. Mas ainda há dúvidas sobre como fazê-lo, né? essa parte prática. 
ou como assegurar que os investimentos realmente estão produzindo os benefícios propostos. É aí por isso que organizamos este evento hoje. É por isso também que mantemos diálogo constante com instituições é, e, e realmente a gente acha imprescindível a parceria que temos com a CVM é, e com o Laboratório de é, Inovação Financeira, que juntos construímos as bases para que o setor prospere. Esses esforços com a CVM, aliás, ganham agora a projeção global. O nosso Laboratório de Inovação Financeira Compartilhada, que mantemos com a CVM, é, é, acaba de ser é, nomeado, é, reconhecido como a primeira organização de América do Sul a ingressar na FC4S, FC4S, a Rede Internacional de Centros Financeiros para a Sustentabilidade. Além do reconhecimento, a edição representa a possibilidade de integrar uma rede global que busca desenvolver mecanismos financeiros inovadores, que integrem desenvolvimento econômico e social ambiental. Apesar da tendência de crescimento e da relevância, este é um mercado ainda em construção, e nossa função como Banco de Desenvolvimento é promover as condições necessárias para que os investidores, emissores e a sociedade em geral tiram o máximo benefício das finanças sustentáveis. Na prática, o nosso compromisso por ajudar o mercado a se desenvolver pode ser visto, por exemplo, pela Green Bonds Transparency Platform. Essa é uma ferramenta que desenvolvemos com mais de 50 parceiros e que ajuda a lidar justamente com a questão de, do reporte dos impactos positivos dos títulos temáticos, que é ainda objeto de dúvidas de alguma parte dos emissores. Né? Para retomar aqui uma ideia que já expus nos eventos anteriores, que foram parte deste World Investor Week, fomentar este mercado é uma maneira de captar a consciência crescente, inclusive impulsionado pela pandemia, de que o retorno financeiro e o desenvolvimento social, ambiental e econômico precisam, podem e devem caminhar lado a lado. O Grupo BID, incluindo o nosso braço de investimento do setor privado, o BID Invest, está a portas abertas para dialogar com outros bancos, governos e empresas para ajudar a incorporar sustentabilidade e impactos positivos em títulos e projetos de infraestrutura. Eu convido aqui a todos vocês que estão nessa, nessa reunião hoje a serem parte dessa, desse movimento. Dessa, dessa possibilidade de transformar esse instrumento realmente em uma forma sustentável de financiar a infraestrutura aqui no Brasil. Gosto de é, é, reconhecer mais uma vez a, ao Vasco da CVM, agradecê-lo pela parceria tão importante para esse mercado e agradecer a Maria e, e aos palestrantes que vêm a, a compartilhar seu conhecimento conosco hoje. Muito obrigado. Passo a palavra para, para nosso parceiro, o, o Vasco, para fazer a sua, as suas palavras introdutórias. Contigo, Vasco. Muito obrigado, Morgan. Bom dia a todos, bom dia aos nossos palestrantes, a quem agradeço pela, por estarem aqui também para compartilhar o seu conhecimento nesse evento que tem é, vários significados. É, primeiro, porque encerramos uma semana de é, centenas de eventos, é, algumas dezenas de eventos, é, mais de uma dezena de eventos realizados em parceria com o Lab de Inovação Financeira, essa iniciativa que é, teve início há três anos atrás, uh, quando o BID e uh, ICVM uh, é, combinaram e planejaram o lançamento de uma de uma plataforma que inicialmente se pensava é, que poderia chegar a 30 pessoas no máximo é, e até caber numa sala da CVM. E hoje nós temos 600 representantes de 200, 197 entidades uh, é, trabalhando em temas de sustentabilidade e de inovação financeira uh, que vão, de fato, e já estão mudando a realidade do país. Um tema estratégico para o mercado de capitais e para todos os mercados é, que não poderia andar é, tão bem Uh, se não tivesse tido esse apoio do, do Banco Interamericano de Desenvolvimento, essa visão 
estratégica e esse apoio que é, posso falar aqui em nome da CVM, a CVM é, agradece muito, reconhece é, é, a, o valor dessa parceria, o que ela agregou e o que nós aprendemos a, com é, a, o compartilhamento de informações com os técnicos do BID de excelente qualidade, com as linhas de frente, com os avanços. Então, é, se eu pudesse recomendar alguma coisa, eu recomendaria a todo é, órgão que queira é, de Estado que queira ter uma visão de futuro para a inovação financeira e para a sustentabilidade, é, pensar numa parceria com o BID, porque ela foi muito transformativa para a CVM nesse específico, nessa área, uh, e está nos beneficiando não apenas o mercado, mas também inter, internamente, as equipes, a capacitação. Então, é, é com uma é, grande satisfação que a gente encerra essa semana de educação, de cultura, de formação, de pessoas e, e, portanto, de instituições também com, um, com esse tema aqui, que é também extremamente relevante para os reguladores de mercado de capitais. Ele é relevante, é, primeiro, no âmbito internacional. Aí hoje, como acho que é bem conhecido, é, publicou um relatório esse ano apontando a, a importância é, de ter uma melhor compreensão das taxonomias e third party frameworks é, disponíveis, existentes no mundo para questões de sustentabilidade e estabelecendo uma task force que é, a ICVM integra uh, para, entre outras questões, é, trabalhar é, essa temática, é, é, avaliar é, questões relacionadas, possíveis questões relacionadas a greenwashing, como prevenir, como proteger os investidores, a, como é, estimular um melhor grau de transparência dessas informações, enfim. É, e, recentemente, ainda no mês de setembro, o secretário-geral da, da IOSCO, uh, em um evento internacional, isso foi reportado no Financial Times, uh, falou do esforço que essa task force terá para encontrar é, pontos comuns entre as diferentes ou as principais é, metodologias uh, e, e fortalecer ou encontrar um caminho que facilite a compreensão dessas informações pelos investidores e o trabalho dos reguladores. A posição da CVM nessa temática sempre foi, até aqui, uma posição de deixar que o mercado decida e escolha é, as, as, é, as taxonomias e metodologias que, que quiser adotar. Ah, não havia uma intenção é, regulatória da CVM nesse campo, e sim a regulação no sentido de cobrar que as escolhas sejam consistentes e sejam reportadas de forma adequada, com o nosso papel de supervisão também. Mas é claro que a discussão avançou e, nesse momento, inclusive dentro desse esforço que a IOSCO está fazendo no âmbito internacional, é fundamental refletir também no Brasil a ampliar essa discussão. Então, vejo que nós encerramos a semana um dos temas mais relevantes para a sustentabilidade no país e, e também com a escolha de instituições que aqui estão, que vão é, ser fundamentais nesse processo de diálogo. A regulação ela, ela tem os objetivos de proteção do investidor, de redução uh, uh, de condutas inadequadas, do risco sistêmico, de aumento da eficiência, mas ela deve ser feita e é feita pela CVM sem desconsiderar é, diversos fatores como o custo de observância, o diálogo com os participantes para entender as, as implicações e nesse tema em especial, é, penso que uma ampla discussão com os participantes do mercado a fim de escolher os caminhos é, que sejam melhores para o desenvolvimento do país. Então, é, é, a gente está aqui num dia muito importante que o país entra também no Financial Center for Sustainability, o que não seria possível você quer se cogitar sem esta parceria com o BID, e eu tenho certeza que esse dia que se encerra é também um marco do que vem para frente. Olhando para trás, volto a dizer, quem poderia imaginar há três anos que nós estaríamos nesse nível de discussão aqui? E essa estrada só pode ser construída com essa é, excelente e fundamental parceria com o Banco Interamericano de Desenvolvimento no país. E nós estamos muito satisfeitos, orgulhosos e agradecidos por toda por todo o esforço. Eu desejo aqui, encerrando as nossas palavras iniciais, um excelente evento a todos. 
Muito obrigado, Vasco, e muito obrigado, Morgan, por essa abertura. É, a gente vai passar daqui a pouco para inglês, porque como o Morgan é, apresentou, nós temos um painel fascinante aqui de vários é, padrões e várias é, boas práticas de mercado que vamos poder compartilhar com o mercado brasileiro, mas a gente está trazendo aqui alguns atores internacionais. né? É, talvez só na abertura, ainda falando um pouco em português e da nossa situação no Brasil, e levantando um pouco os temas que o próprio Morgan e o Vasco já levantaram, é, o Laboratório de Inovação Financeira, onde a gente está junto com a CVM, com o pessoal da Associação Brasileira de Desenvolvimento, a BDE, e o GIZ dos alemães, coordenando, mas que tem mais de 600 especialistas e 160 instituições que estão trabalhando no mercado financeiro de capitais no Brasil, vem olhando com muito, muita atenção o tema de como integrar a sustentabilidade né, no nosso sistema financeiro, e particularmente nesse mercado novo que o, que o Morgan ressaltou, dos títulos verdes e temáticos, a gente vem vendo uma tendência importante né, de considerar como é, tratar melhor né, é, a questão da padronização das taxonomias, sem que isso, como o Vasco bem levantou, seja um processo top-down. Né? No próprio Lab, saiu muito forte que os atores do mercado acham importante deixar o mercado desenvolver essas práticas. Por outro lado, o Lab, há uns anos atrás já, fez uma, uma, uma análise do mercado, a gente fez uma pesquisa, a pesquisa foi feita com mais de 100 participantes do mercado, né? e foi muito interessante porque é, a maioria dos investidores, o que levantou foi uma preocupação é, de um tema que hoje estava na Valor Econômico, né? um artigo da Valor Econômico, que é o greenwashing, né? que é a preocupação sobre... É, o fato de que eles, de repente, têm preocupação de investir nesse mercado sem saber se o ativo que ele está realmente investido é verde ou não. Né? E, e, nesse sentido, eu acho que a, a questão aqui, é, além de terem várias taxonomias e como os investidores, os emissores no mercado participam, tem essa questão também da transparência e da importância que o mercado possa mostrar que, de fato, ele tem um impacto socioambiental. So turning maybe to English now, so that we can have the advantage of having a dialogue. Uh, as uh, Morgan already said, in case anybody wants to switch the language, we have a bottom on the top, on the bottom of the of the um, uh, screen with the world uh, uh, signal, and you can there get the English or Portuguese translation. Vocês podem ter tradução uh, para português no caso precisarem está aí abaixo na, 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 na nossa, na, como se diz, na nossa, na, na nossa apresentação aqui. Uh, I will start with Nicolas Pfaff, he is from ICMA, uh, as Morgan already presented. Uh, Nicolas, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions relating directly to what I was just mentioning before. Uh, we have seen in Brazil in particular that the green bond space has developed a lot. Uh, it is, let's say, recognized and it's, it goes without saying in our days that all the green bonds that are issued, at least uh, most of them in Latin America as well, are those that should be validated by a second party and that we should have a review of uh, the quality of those issuances. However, uh, we do have a question about what has been the experience with the post issuance Uh, checking of what is being done in terms of um, the uh, use of proceeds, but also the impacts of the bonds. Uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, us, together with the Climate Bond Initiative last year, we did a survey in Latin America, and actually we saw that only 1% of such issuances were doing validation and reviewing, uh, uh, let's say, what happened with this bonds afterwards. So I would like to ask you, what, has, what is your perception a bit from the global market with regards to this, let's say, next step, which is a, is a good step, which is the meaning that our market has been developing, and now we start looking at what has been done with this, uh, uh, these bonds. What is the latest uh, on this, and what is your perception regarding this? Well, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, and, and I'm delighted to speak to a Brazilian audience. I think this is the first time. Um, and I think it's a very welcome development. Um, on the uh, 
question of um, ex post uh, checking. I think it's 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 absolutely fair to say that the emphasis in the market has been to date on the pre-issuance side. And um, if you look, you know, firstly, you look at what is the guidance in the Green Bond principles, which of course are the principles that, that ICMA uh, hosts. It is uh, first a strong recommendation to have your allocation audited. So the first check is, where did the money go? Um, and, and this is, you know, relatively straightforward because it can come down to, to uh, an audit style exercise. Now, where things get um, uh, more interesting and where there's been a lot of work is uh, this question of impact reporting. Um, and what we have been doing is, you know, first in the principles is to say, you know, we really recommend that you do provide impact reporting, uh, both during and at the end of the, um, of the green bond. Uh, but also we, you know, we recognize that, that you, know, you need to have guidance on, on what should be in the impact report and, and what kind of metrics can you provide. And so we have an ongoing uh, working group, which um, brings together, and this won't surprise many of you listening, uh, the uh, International Development Bank community where a lot of work has been uh, going on. And so it's not as if we've constituted this group of, you know, of new scientists and new academics. What we're doing is we're bringing together, you know, through our convening power, those institutions who've already got a great track record in, 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 uh, in looking at this work. And um, under the chairmanship of the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction Development, and KFW from Germany, we have, with this, this working group, been bringing out every year um, sectoral impact uh, uh, reporting guidance, most recently for biodiversity. So we now have a, a handbook, which every year gets expanded, where sector by sector, you know, we slowly try to, to develop best practice for impact reporting. So that's what's happening, I think, in terms of the guidance. Now, if you look at what's happening in the market, I think most issuers do try to do impact reporting. Um, again, I think allocation reporting is, is something which is very much market practice. Um, is, is it at this stage clear that everybody's doing the impact reporting right? No, I think that's, you know, we don't have perhaps, a, you, know, a, a, you know, something which is, is completely satisfactory. But again, I think a lot of work is, is going on in this space. Um, the last comment I'd make is, you know, if you look at the EU Green Bond Standard, which is the potential standard being developed in the EU, the, the requirement on this question is very much in the um, one which is highlighted in, um, in the framework, which is recommended, i.e. issuers have to explain how they will do impact reporting. And then the allocation reporting is a requirement and then the impact reporting needs to be done but it doesn't necessarily have to be verified. And this, this may be anticipating, you know, further questions from you. Okay, uh, Nicholas, a lot of further questions from my side, but uh, I will have probably an, a second round of questions. You were talking about these uh, good practices on impact reporting for green. What is being done on sustainable SDG side? Uh, there, in the case of Brazil, actually, we only recently had the first uh, social bond. There is very little experience yet with sustainable. Yeah. Uh, it's a much smaller market, right? So uh, on the other hand, particularly now with the COVID crisis and the need to do recovery, uh, frankly, we cannot say the recovery is only green. It needs to be also social and inclusive, no? And the question is for you, how do you see this work that you were able to start doing, say, at a global level for green, moving as well to the SDG and sustainable side? Uh, there, I think we also, even with regards to the pre-issuance, we still have a lot of questions on what is the actual framework. No? So it would be interesting to get your perception of how this is moving. And, uh, you know, I think it's an inspiration to think 
uh, on what yeah. you're saying. And I have a lot of ideas already on our uh, Brazilian <laughs> laboratory, how we can collaborate. Okay. But uh, uh, please, please go ahead. Well, first, we, we'd very much welcome the cooperation and we have a a social bond working group, which is, is of course, gaining, has always been very important, but it's always going to gain more and more in importance because perhaps as a preliminary comment, um, social bonds until recently was indeed the, the, the junior standard, you know, compared to, to the green bond principles and the sustainability bond guidelines, which essentially, you know, provide the confirmation that you can mix green and social together. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was, there had been, you know, more traction, I think, in the last uh, two years or for these, these mixed bonds, if you prefer. But um, by any measure, this year is the year of the social bond. Um, uh, the pandemic has created the, um, the need for greater social issuance. And, and, and in a way, uh, the market was looking for a solution and the social bonds, the social bond principles were there. Um, now, what people may not realize because there's been a lot less discussion about social bonds is this doesn't date from yesterday. We, we launched this five years ago and we, again, we didn't you know, you know, pluck it from nowhere. This was based um, on a lot of, of work that had been done by international development banks and also by national promotional banks. Um, there are specialized national institutions, regional institutions that function social, and of course, you know, the World Bank Group, the Inter-American Development Bank, et cetera, all have had a track record in bringing out um, social themed bonds. And, you know, these can be on gender issues, you know, women empowerment bonds, education bonds, et cetera. So, so there was um, already a lot of work out there. It just hadn't reached the scale of, of green bonds. And we've had a social bond working group, which one has been developing the principles and one to, to make the link with what you were saying, your question specifically is, we also provide specific guidance for impact reporting. So there is a separate document which provides this. Now, of course, the, the, the difficulty, uh, but also the opportunity with social is, it's a much wider topic. Um, you know, one of the problems we faced when we're putting together social bond principles is, you know, everything can be social. So how do you narrow it down to make it something which is, is um, avoids the pitfalls of, of being too wide and being, you know, dilutive. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, be clear in terms of what's trying to be achieved. And so without going into details, you have a definition of for social categories. You have a definition of what is a social project. You have to link your social product to a specific targeted population. It can't just be for anybody. You have to identify who you're trying to help you have to have metrics, and then you also have to subsequently describe the social outcome which you are aiming for. And so that does provide a conceptual framework and market practices, which I think underpin this market. Now, what we will most likely never have in this market is the certainty of, of you know, um, hard science thresholds. You know, in, in green, you can have mm -hmm. a scientific or at least a technical definition of what is green. In social, we're never going to have that. It's a bit like the distinction between the hard sciences and the social sciences. You know, in social, there's always going to be more intuition. Um, but, I, but I'd like to, to reassure those that think that, that you know, social bonds are, are by definition uh, uh, more fuzzy, if I can put it that way, than green bonds. That's not the case. There's a lot of track record. There's a lot of guidance. And it's important that issuers and investors are aware of it. Thank you so much, Nicolas. I'll come back to you after I go through another round. Uh, I have quite a few areas that I think we can develop further, but I think it's very important what you were mentioning that we get to know, and maybe one question I will bring later is precisely the question of transparency. How can we promote those impact guidance that are being developed to be better known in the market? No? Very good. Uh, going to Stacy, uh, Stacy with the TCFD, you have been looking a lot more about the governance side as well, no? And uh, the TCFD has been doing a great work in trying to promote uh, financial systems disclosures in terms of their track record, but also understanding not only individually for every investment, what is the responsibility of the financial market as a whole with regards to uh, their exposure, um, the types of things they are doing. 
I wanted a bit to ask you precisely from this point of view more of governance. So here, before we were talking a bit about the guidance for the impacts, but also part of what investors are looking for today is to understand also what is the track record overall of the corporation or the issuer in terms of uh, what is the governance, no? How do you see the, the climate related financial disclosures that you are promoting in TCFD being important uh, and bringing an additional, let's say, um, layer for the discussion on sustainability? Great, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to also thank IOSCO and the Inter-American Development Bank and IDB Invest for organizing this discussion and inviting me to participate. Um, I think it's incredibly important. And so maybe I'll just take a quick second and talk a little bit about what the TCFD recommendations are, just so everybody's on the same page. Um, our recommendations were published back in June 2017, and they're the result of, I think, the first industry-led effort to create guidelines for disclosing climate-related risks and opportunities in mainstream financial filings. And so, while well, the task force was created by the Financial Stability Board, which is a, a group of financial regulators from around the world, um, the primary focus was to help industry participants develop disclosures that could be used by uh, lenders, uh, investors, and insurance underwriters in making financial decisions. And so I think the recommendations are sort of central to a lot of um, efforts to disclose climate-related information. Clearly, we're not a broader sustainability framework. We focus strictly on climate and financial risk. And so I think what's made our recommendations successful is that our membership is a balance of users, so investors and lenders and insurance companies, um, as well as preparers. So we have a lot of non-financial companies and financial companies um, that put forward disclosures so that people can make better decisions. So um, as Maria noted, you know, one of our overarching recommendations are, is around governance. And we view that as a, a critical element of the entirety of our disclosure recommendations. Um, governance focusing on what is the board doing and what is management doing in the context of climate related risks, managing those, um, how they change strategy around it, what kind of data they report. And so, um, we're getting ready to issue a, another status report and one of our findings is that while governance is a recommendation, we suggest everybody disclose. Um, it's actually one of the lower recommended disclosures that companies do report on. And we need to dig further into why that's the case. Um, there's actually more disclosure by companies on the climate related risks that they have and what they're doing, kind of their plans around um, managing those and, and how they've changed strategy to address it. Um, so I think that's an area where we definitely need to see more uh, improvement. Now, when it comes to why it's important to pay attention to the governance, this is an area that we've heard from investors. We did a survey as part of our status report this year to understand what users want and one of the key parts of the information that they look for, in addition to what is the financial impact on a company of climate change, they also wanna know how this is being governed and what steps they're taking to manage the risks and is the board involved in decisions around what the company does on climate risks. And so I think as we've been seeing within the task force, and I think you can even check the news and find that this is happening more regularly. Um, as more than 120 countries move towards a net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, as they move in that direction, more and more of them will start to mandate or legislate companies disclose climate related information. Um, some of those countries are already pushing the task force's recommendations as the framework to use to disclose that information. Um, and we think many more will also move in that direction 
to ask companies to disclose in line with the recommendations. Um, as I'm sure others will talk about on the panel, when it comes to green bonds, out of the you know, 100 trillion bond market that exists, less than 1% are actually green bonds. And as companies and countries move to meet the Paris Agreement and align with a net zero world, more and more investment is going to be funneled to um, green bonds and financing that advances movement toward a lower emission global economy. And so as you take all that into account, we think that the task force's recommendations will become increasingly important for companies to adopt and for investors to ask for. And so we think that going forward, it'll be critical that companies and investors think about the task force's recommendations and build on with other things like Nicholas talked about and SASB will talk about in terms of all these things coming together to become more of a foundation of how companies look at risks and how investors assess risk broadly, right? Financial risk related to climate change will become a core element of how companies and, and investors look at these risks. And so we're encouraged that this is being discussed here today and look forward to the continued discussion. Stacey, this is a very important point. You know, the fact that we have to look at the impacts, but also the risks. And I think this is the issue. You know, uh, most of the green bonds at the beginning were looking at, uh, well, I have a green benefit, but did I, for example, also consider that the location of my project or the way I constructed infrastructure considered also the potential negative impacts of the climate in the infrastructure or at the infrastructure in the surroundings, be it uh, as uh, environmental or social impacts. No? So this integration of also considering green not only the positive impact, but also not damaging and also the resilience of these investments is very important. And sometimes we tend not to understand that there is this three-dimensional issue, you know, that there could be a negative impact from the investment, environment can impact our investments and we need to be aware of that so we need to consider that in, when we do the investments and we also of course are wanting to promote positive green and social impacts question for you is what examples would you have or is there an example of good example of uh, uh, a bond or a green bond initiative that has already been conversating with the tcfd recommendations and that we could use as uh, let's say something we could flag as a something to follow. So on the green bond side, um, it's not an area the task force is directly focused on because in theory, we're agnostic to uh, the types of financing that occurs. I exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but there are several different investor organizations out there um, working together that I would suggest people check out in terms of there's Climate Action 100, which is over 500 investors with, oh, I think it's what, 47 trillion of assets collectively that they have under management, um, that they're pushing companies to use the TCFD recommendations and disclose against those. And they're also looking at shareholder proposals and they do a lot of different work. There's also Ceres, C E. RES mm -hmm. that has case studies on its website. Um, and I would imagine at least one of them has something on green bonds, um, but they talk about how to use climate related, related information disclosed by companies in making decisions. And then there's the um, international uh, investor group on climate change. And they have issued guidelines on how to use climate related information in making decisions. And so I think that would be relevant in looking at uh, green bonds as well as other types of instruments. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of information out there and we can pull together those resources and share so that you can send to the participants. But um, I don't have a particular example of a company that's done something or an investor mm -hmm. that has looked at it, but there's a wide range of information available. 
Thank you very much, Stacey. I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of questions on that. <laughs> and indeed, maybe we need to kind of see how we can share this. Uh, I will pass to Arturo now, precisely coming on these discussions we had before. No? Good practices on impact and on the other hand, uh, how do we handle uh, governance and risks? No? Um, you have on the SASP here been already working independent of for bond markets uh, for a while to help, uh, let's say, uh, investments to integrate those concerns sustainability for a while. I wanted to kind of you to give us your perception, Arturo, of what is the relevance of standards or these taxonomies. Sometimes they can help, but what are, how, how is this being done? What are the lessons learned also of what worked so well and what did not maybe work so simply? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers of the event for uh, inviting me and SASB uh, to uh, convey our message here in this platform. Uh, and as Stacy uh, started, I just want to give my uh, elevator pitch of SASB so that we can uh, start from the uh, same starting point and then I'll answer your question. So for those of you that don't know SASB very much, SASB is a nonprofit standard setting organization uh, whose objective is connecting uh, businesses and investors on the financial impacts of sustainability. And we do this by uh, focusing our standards on uh, two main points, uh, industry specificity, and we have 77 industry specific uh, sustainability disclosure standards, and also focusing those standards in uh, enterprise value creation and financial materiality. Our standards identify the ESG factors that are reasonably likely to affect the financial condition, operating performance, or risk profile of companies within an industry. So I just wanted to give that uh, quick uh, pitch so that, again, we're all starting from the uh, same starting point. So uh, to your specific question, I think all of, uh, all of us in this panel and all of us in the audience agree that um, financial and, financial and non-financial standards and frameworks help create a baseline, uh, a foundational, foundational layer of high quality company um, reported information, which the rest of the uh, capital markets can rely on. Um, and I use the, the terms framework and standards uh, separately because in the view of SASB, these are two different uh, participants in the uh, sustainability reporting ecosystem. Uh, frameworks uh, are organizations uh, that define how information should be presented. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Stacy was talking about the TCFD and how the information should uh, describe a company's leadership governance strategy around uh, climate risks and opportunities, right? Uh, so that's, in our mind, that's, that's a framework. And then there are standard setting organizations like, like SASB that take uh, different sustainability topics uh, and describe what, not how, but what information, what specific information should be uh, presented to investors or disclosed to investors so that there can be um, useful information out there in the market. Um, so it's important to, to, to note the subtle difference between frameworks and standards because uh, like with the financial uh, information ecosystem, the sustainability reporting ecosystem is very diverse and we have uh, frameworks and standards underlying and providing that base for, for reporting and transparency. And we have all the different players in the capital markets that use that information, right? From reporters to software providers to auditors that uh, verify that information to uh, data providers that aggregate that information and analytic platforms that uh, use proprietary information to create their own scores. Uh, and all that information, that sustainability information flows to end users and regulators to determine uh, what companies are performing better uh, under certain um, sustainability, uh, environmental and social topics. And um, this of course, um, is very important uh, for, for uh, sustainable investments. And uh, what's, wh what is also important to understand is that uh, unlike the financial, uh, traditional financial information, sustainability information is more complex because there, is, there are many use cases for sustainability information, uh, financial information in one hand, the only um, 
I guess, uh, stakeholders that require or, or, or need that information are economic decision makers. But with sustainability information, there's a wide array of, a wide array of stakeholders that want to get information on how a company uh, is doing in terms of environmental and social issues. In one hand, we have, um, of course, investors that may, may, of course, want to, to know more about how companies affecting the environment or society, as well as how society and the environment are affecting uh, the company itself. Uh, but also, uh, there, there, there are other stakeholders that want to know more uh, uh, about this information apart from investors, and that may include social, uh, civil society, uh, governments, employees, uh, supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. So that is why uh, we at SASB uh, look at um, sustainability information in a, in, in, in a way, you can think of, of sustainability information uh, and enterprise, enterprise value creation uh, in a nested way. Uh, it's, it's the nested materiality concept, concept that we're trying to, to, to convey and push uh, in where there's definitely information on sustainability that um, reflects an organization's significant impacts on the economy, uh, environment, and people, then that's, that's a big um, circle, if you will. And then it, within that circle, there's a, there's a subset, of sustain, subset of sustainability topics that are material, financially material for enterprise value creation. And uh, within that um, circle of enterprise value creation, topics, there's also reporting that already happens in financial accounts. And of course, all of these, um, this concept of, of nested materiality comes together because um, the different actors that want to get their hands on sustainability information, what they want is uh, basically transparency and disclosure so that they can use that information to compare the performance of a company or a bond uh, or a portfolio with uh, another one and see which one will uh, create more benefits for society or, or the environment or, or uh, sustainability in general, as well as um, uh, protect the economic performance of, 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 of a given portfolio or, or, or a set of actions. Okay, it's a very good point. So what you were saying basically is that these issuers uh, when they are actually using these data sets and using your standards are also should be looking at not only necessarily only the bond issuance, but the overall use of those in the, this data for many reasons, no? for management, for, for how they are perceived in the market, for relationship with buyers and, uh, and value chains and so on. So that, that's a very good point. Uh, Coming back a bit on the question I had before uh, uh, with the, the discussion with Nicolas, you said you are dealing with sustainable uh, uh, information. Are you looking both at social and green and how do you see the different uh, use of those data? And would be interesting to understand in particular with regards to Latin America and other countries in the world, no? Uh, what is the difficulty or the facility you have seen to promote these uh, standards in terms of, as you said, it's important also the information that people are able to collect and present. How do you see the practices with regards to that? Yeah, so I, I guess there are two questions there. The first one is on social and environmental, so I'll answer that one first. Uh, the SASB standards, the uniqueness of the SASB standards is that they um, are uh, industry specific, right? Uh, we do cover social and environmental topics as well as uh, topics that relate to the manufacturing or provision of, of uh, manufacturing of products or provision of services and how social and environmental aspects are embedded in the uh, design of products and services. And uh, the beauty of the, the, the SASB standards uh, is that they are industry specific. So depending on the industry, uh, the disclosure topics that are included in the SASB standards will be more biased towards the environmental side or the social side, depending on the industry. So you can think of, I'll give you an example. You can think of uh, the standard of the oil and gas exploration and production industry. That, that is, of course, a very environmentally um, biased, if you will, uh, industry that has a lot of, that, that can have a lot of uh, positive or negative impacts on the environment. 
Uh, so if, if that standard will be more biased towards environmental topics. But if you were to download the standard for, I don't know, uh, uh, biotech and pharmaceutical industry, that's an industry that is uh, focused almost exclusively on, on social uh, issues, right? Health, uh, promoting um, health across the world. So um, this, this, all, this is all to say that the, the standards uh, do cover a lot of uh, different sustainability issues from environmental and social to other stuff like governance and corruption, et cetera. And depending on the industry, since we are focused on the topics that actually focus on enterprise value creation and financial materiality in the long term, um, the, the mix of those topics might differ from industry to industry. So I hope that answers your first question. Then the second question uh, on uh, Latin America. Um, so um, one of the things that uh, SASB learned very early on during uh, its creation, uh, we started by focusing first on the US uh, market and the US capital markets. But we quickly realized that the language of sustainability and financial materiality is actually spoken across the world. And it doesn't matter if you're a company in Brazil or a company in the US or a company in Mexico where, where I'm speaking uh, right now uh, or in Europe or whatever, but investors and companies across the world want to um, know more information about uh, the key uh, aspects of sustainability that may impact enterprise value creation. So in that way, uh, SASB is a, the SASB standards uh, talk to companies and investors across the world. And of course, there are specific challenges, regional challenges and country specific challenges for, for each market, uh, depending on the maturity of, of uh, sustainability disclosure and the robustness of their institutions and regulators, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody understands that the SASB standards, while they originated in the, in the United States, they are applicable to companies across the world. And we actually have seen uh, examples of um, companies in Latin America and Brazil reporting on the SASB standards. Uh, the SASB standards were developed uh, in their final version in late 2018. And so far we have identified 19 reporters in the region. Uh, in this first round of, uh, of reporting. And of those 19 reports in Latin America and South America, nine of them, uh, more than, than, than uh, almost uh, half are based in Brazil. So we're seeing companies uh, in Brazil and in the region starting to, to look at their standards and see value in, 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 in talking and providing information and transparency on, the, um, on these key topics that uh, may impact enter enterprise value creation. Thank you very much, Arturo. This was a very, very, very interesting. Also, lots of other questions. I think we almost, uh, Vasco, agree with me. Can we organize with each of you uh, a separate webinar with the lab for our uh, participants in the lab to learn more? Uh, I would like also now to turn to Marcelo. And also actually following on what we just discussed on the three different perspectives, be it from principles, framework, standards, uh, in all cases, we have different ways of looking at sustainability. I think all of them are actually quite complementary, but it's still there is a question of how can we uh, harmonize these disclosure practices. No, uh, Marcelo, you are working with the PRI, and in Brazil, you have been uh, doing a, a lot of work already with investors. I would like to to learn a bit from you, Marcelo. What is your perception? of uh, what are the, the key steps for us to promote more of this harmonization process, particularly from the investor point of view. Thank you, Maria. Uh, well, this is a $1, million, $1 billion question, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the, the IDB for inviting me for this discussion and IDB and the other organizations. Uh, this topic is very, very important for the PRI, uh, for you to have an idea. One of the uh, strategic goals that the PRI has in its 10-year uh, blu blueprint is driving meaningful data throughout markets, which means that uh, uh, the PRI is, is trying to uh, get more and more involved in this issue to try to contribute with this discussion, of course, uh, being uh, uh, neutral and of course, it also uh, giving the perspective of the of the uh, investors mainly. However, 
the, the PRI has just uh, 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 joined a, a collaboration initiative with the World, world I'm sorry, a, uh, the World Business Council for Sustain Sustainability uh, Sustainable Development, and one of the objectives of this collaboration is to contribute with the with the several initiatives that has been uh, raised in, in this in this topic. And, uh, and, and of course, as I said, given the, the, uh, the investor's perspective. Uh, but of course, when, when we say, uh, when we talk about harmonization, it's very important to explain that uh, what kind, uh, we have, first of all, to, we have to think what kind of harmonization we are, we are thinking about, right? We're not trying to, uh, I don't think we need a, a, a fifth or, or sixth uh, standard or, or framework, whatever, and I'm going to change uh, the word uh, uh, standard for, for framework here. I'm sorry about this uh, lack of, of, uh, of knowledge on this, on this uh, topic. But uh, the thing is that uh, what, what the, the market needs, uh, and I think it's the, the, the PRI position, is uh, using frameworks that converge in their uh, main aspects of the re reporting, sustainability reporting uh, uh, aspect of the sustainability reporting uh, issue. So uh, when it, in, back in 2018, two years ago, the, the, the PRI published a, uh, a document called the Investor Agenda for Corporate uh, ESG Reporting. And it was already identified that, of course, harmonization of corporate reporting was one of the biggest cha challenges, but not only this, but also the fragmentation of the data for investment decisions. And, uh, and thirdly, the lack of end-to-end -end reporting that investors and, and the benef beneficiaries need on ESG issues. So what, what are the main uh, meaningful uh, informations that the, the beneficiary uh, needs in terms of ES ESG? So uh, this report uh, was a, a starting point so that the, uh, the PRI got uh, involved in this, in this agenda. But to be more uh, concrete in your, in your answer, I think the, the most important thing is to uh, start from scratch, you know, and to understand what is the basis, what are the, the fundamentals that, that, has to be, that have to be behind uh, 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 sustainability, sustainability report. What kind of information we need there? And I'm, I'm, it, it sounds very obvious, but, but when you kind of empty your, your mind, I think you, you sometimes you come out with, uh, with uh, uh, better ideas and, and avoid the bias that you know, maybe one framework or standard has and, and the other one that maybe has a different bias. So I think this is a, a first uh, a movement that I think it's very important to do. Uh, another step, uh, towards uh, uh, this kind of uh, harmonization is uh, kind of uh, working on a stock taking analysis on how the, the, the existing standards are doing in terms of uh, are they uh, meeting the investors need, needs and the corporate, corporate needs. So this is very, uh, very important and to see the gaps that uh, these standards have uh, compared to the the, uh, the ideal standard that we that we are looking for, but basically what we uh, we think when we think about harmonization, we immediately think about comparable uh, sustainability data. However, sometimes being comparable doesn't mean uh, being meaningful. So it, it's very it's very hard to to uh, to get this this balance between comparability and 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 you know how meaningful the information is. But the most important thing I, I, I think in this, in this kind of harmonized uh, uh, framework or, or, or standard is that we have to identify ESG risks and opportunities, which means that ESG factors that likely impact the financial conditions and, and operating performance, they have to be, uh, and of course with financial materiality, they have to be uh, uh, a very clear in, in this kind of report. And also it's very important that in this, uh, in this uh, report, in this uh, ESG risk and opportunity, we uh, include forward looking approach, just like the TCFED uh, uh, has uh, uh, recommended in their, in their framework, okay? But also not only the ESG risks and opportunities, but also the sustainability performance 
is something that has to be, uh, we, we, when, when we see a, a report, we, a corporate report, we want to understand how the, the, the company is going on in terms of sustainability performance, how the entity uh, uh, operations and products impact positively or negatively stakeholders and, and the environment. So basically, uh, these are the, the two uh, dimensions that we have to look for in a, in a, in a report. But I have to make a, a caveat here. Uh, uh, we have to admit that there will be no perfect uh, framework or standard. Uh, we have to recognize the limitations and boundaries of corporate reporting and identify other data source that need to support investment in corporate decision making. And, and it's very uh, easy to understand this because uh, everybody knows that there's no uh, one size fits all solution for a very complex uh, um, issue like this. And also, I think it's very important to recognize the relevance of the, of the country and global sustainability objectives in contextualizing and, and tracking performance. Which means that, again, um, a determined uh, uh, KPI doesn't make much sense in determined area or in determined region or in determined uh, uh, sector uh, compared to, to others. So, we, we always have to make, uh, to put the, 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 the data on the context of, the, of that area, of the, that industry, of that re region. So uh, I think it's, it's very important that we, we think that we will not have like a, a, a harmonized, 100% harmonized uh, model. There will be no uh, silver bullet to, that will uh, solve all these issues. But it's very good that there are a lot of energy and there are a lot of initiatives working towards this, uh, this uh, attempt of harmonizing, harmonizing uh, uh, the disclosure of sustainability issues. I don't know if I covered, oh, oh yeah, uh, you, you asked me about the stakeholders, right? That, yes. Uh, Mm -hmm. I wanted precisely to follow up. I think there is an interesting point you made here to say you need to look at different perspectives when the investor is looking at, a, at a, an opportunity, right? So coming back to the bond market, green or sustainable, uh, I, I like your approach to say, well, there is the impacts, there is the governance, and there might be very different perspectives also uh, with regards to what the the investors may expect from the corporations. No? So the sustainability comes also with the, the perception of the, the issuer as a whole. No? Exactly. What do you think? I know I understand what you mean that you know, harmonization with one silver bullet will not work. And we, we heard from the previous presentations also that probably you need to have different uh, you know, approaches depending on sectors and depending on uh, the materiality of what you want to do. Uh, but that said, what would you see as recommendable or important to engage investors in the Brazilian market in the green and sustainable bond? And what would they be expecting? What could be improved to make sure that even though, as you say, there is no fully harmonized approach, there is at least a converging one that considers and makes transparent uh, these needs for the investors? Uh Maria, uh, the PRI has a, a very strong focus on, on engagement. So, uh, and, and it's not because uh, the PRI chose engagement as, a, as an instrument to, to, uh, to really exercise responsible investment, but it's because engagement really works. So uh, when we talk about the, uh, the green bonds and, and how, uh, and, and the credibility of the, of the green bond market, and I think transparency uh, is, is part of, of, this, of this issue, the, the, how credible we, we will have, uh, uh, the, the, the issuance will, will, have in this, it will be in this, in this market. I think engagement is, is very important and, and, uh, you, and, and investors can engage prior to the, to the, to the issuance and, and, and post issuance and, and you know that it's very possible. And uh, we, we can never look for a standardized uh, uh, framework or standard that will uh, give you the, the answers. We'll, you probably will have to, to do it from scratch. 
you know so it, it's it's uh, it's hard to say if I, I don't know if you know the audience here wanted to listen that we'll have some something that uh, will will solve our problems but as I, as I said before uh, there's no uh, uh, there's no uh, perfect solution to this but I think that as soon as we we engage investor as soon as investors engage better with their with their issuers uh, and and you know the, the greenwashing is uh, risk is mitigated I think the market will be more uh, credible and will work better and will grow uh, better in a more organized way. Of course, there are a lot of things going on. The taxonomy, uh, European taxonomy is, is, you know, it started in Europe and, and will start uh, somehow uh, uh, here in, in Brazil, uh, hopefully soon. But uh, I think all these this, uh, initiatives help to, to develop the market and, and to foster the, the, the green finance market in Brazil. Thank you so much. Again, Mauricio, lots of things. The PRI is already collaborating with the lab. Maybe we need to talk more about this education side um, and work more close together. Glaucia, I wanted to turn to you now and look at a bit more uh, this engagement thing that we were talking with Mauricio with regards to investors. How do we look about the engagement with regards to companies, uh, considering that there is an array of standards and indicators uh, Arturo was mentioning the question of data also, no? Uh, what is your experience? You have been working with the Global Reporting Initiative for a while in helping companies to precisely develop such reports. What has been the lessons learned that we could consider here uh, for promoting the green and, and sustainable bonds markets in Brazil? Glaucia? We can't hear you. Uh, hi, hi, Maria. I'm sorry. I, I my connection. Now we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, my connection just. Uh, I had a problem with the connection. Sorry. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to to thank you for inviting me, and it's an honor to be here amongst so uh, important and special guests. And I would like to start by um, talking a little about GRI. It's a very, yeah, very, very uh, short. It's a GRI was established in 19, 1997, but it was initiated in 1989 due to the Exxon Valdez accident. So by that time, institutional investors starting, started discussing how they could improve their making, decision making process. So they found out that they needed more information beyond the financial report they had. So basically, they needed to know how the financial value presented in the report were created. So we are working on that since 1997 and our standards are principles based. And we also have specific top, topic disclosures um, divided in uh, socio, economic, and environmental uh, disclosures. Our aim uh, is to promote a new mindset in the business uh, that goes beyond the financial mindset. And um, our methodology uh, aims to uh, help company to manage and be transparent about their own impact, positive and negative. And it's very good to understand their risks, their risks and opportunities, and also to see, uh, to have, uh, uh, to foresight uh, what is uh, coming in the future. So it's the external impacts that comes to the company. So and the voluntary standards can help. I, I'm saying that not only GRI, but also including SASB, CDP, TCFD, it's the same. Uh, but there are conditions to use them. So, and I think that uh, I can mention that they, they can promote internal and external transparency, and this will lead to robust management. The existing voluntary standards and indicator can, assisting, can assist by providing this uh, disclosures that are not presenting in the financial tools, environmental disclosures, social disclosures, corporate governance information, which is, I think it's 
uh, fundamental and for GRI it's fundamental so it's not there is no um, need to say if it's material or not it's material for all companies that are um, intending to to issue a sustainability report um, against GRI standards um, the use of these tools can promote can promote a holistic view of the company risks and opportunities better management the sustainability or ESG reporting tools first are excellent to, tool. Uh, I think it's very important to mention uh, for internal transparency, um, where we have uh, complete and right information for decision-making process. Then not, not only the report will be robust, but also the management process of the company will be, will be more robust. And this is the first condition for the external transparency and reporting proceeds. Uh, it can be for bonds, social bonds, green bonds, or whatever investment, whatever type of investments. Um, they can also promote a systemic view of the company and make that company understand where they are in the or position in the whole discussion of sustainability. So um, by, me, by, did, by this, I, I mean, we cannot forget the systemic connection with the, e, seeing the ESG issues themselves. For example, you can have a good performance and environmental issues or green aspects inside the company, but it can be reduced to zero if the company is related for uh, related, for example, to social issues as corruption, tax avoidance, slavery, and so on. Um, at the end of this, the sum up will be zero, right? Uh, um, related to the use of that, I, I think we can already mention some example of companies, for example, uh, a good one uh, that are doing ESG reporting and using that for the tracking of the, the, the bonds, the, the proceeds of the bonds is um, Susano, which recently issued a sustainability linked bond. Um, so they use that information and ESG disclosure uh, to interact with the investors. And they are using GRI, IRC, SASB, TCFD, and other uh, tools uh, harmonized. So and it's meaningful for their management process as well. So I think this is the second one. Uh, and I think that the condition one that I'm seeing, yeah, and um, I'm talking and I'm visiting companies um, daily basis. So I think that the condition, the most important condition for the two, um, two, two advantage I mentioned before are the under, is the understanding of the board members of the, this new issue. So the board members are the last one to arrive in this discussion. So, and they are the, the missing link for this discussion. So their engagement will be, um, is important because it will make sure that the strategy they design is related to the operation, related to what they are discussing and sustainability uh, operation inside the company. Um, we we did um, we made a kind of research last year because I was so intrigued by the companies that have have, have very good and engaged. Um, ESG area or sustainability area and uh, I was intrigued why they were also related to several scandals and problems, accidents. So we made the research and uh, we confirmed that the problem is a cultural barrier and there is a hierarchical problem inside the companies and a good uh, ESG performance um, will depend on the board, um, the board involvement in this discussion. And um, I think that it's the first question you, you made for me, right? Should I go directly to the second one? 
Yeah, so basically, uh, I think what, we, no, that's very good. I mean, what you're saying is basically at the end, it boils down to take advantage of different standards and opportunities, but also mm -hmm. it's very important to have good governance and that the investors understand and can see that the companies are really taking this seriously, you know, that this is not just one shot, you no? Know? Um, a, a bit thinking about the standardizing all these practices. No, you have been again uh, for a while now trying to have data sets and so on. I was wondering how the companies can better navigate what kind of uh, I, I, I take it that maybe standardization is not the best word. Uh, I, I think Marcelo convinced me, but how can we promote this convergence at the level of also the companies? I think they they do see a lot of different uh, opportunities. The case of Susano you gave is an excellent one of combining that, but from your side, what can we do? I mean, thinking about Brazil again, the lab, uh, what can we do to promote better this convergence if we were to support companies to promote a better, uh, let's say, convergence uh, efforts? Um, better convergence. I think that it, it would be, as I mentioned, it could be important, it would be important to have, for example, lab for board members. And <laughs> if they were okay. the last one to arrive in the discussion, it's true, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they, uh, you know, it's, and I'm talking to companies every day and they say, oh, it's difficult to achieve or to arrive or to, to make them understand what we are saying. The, the, the common thing is just to, to the sustainability area to present what they are doing and the risks and opportunities. And after that, they say, so, oh, it's okay, it's beautiful, but let's talk about business now. So I think that it's important to, to bring them on board of this discussion. And um, I think it will be a, 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 good, a good advancement uh, in this. And uh, related to, um, uh, how to make the, the the harmonization? I think that there are um, the synergies are there. You know, I think that the misunderstanding of the how. Um, just now, I learned it, that the company uh, approached a professional uh, leader in the sustainability field and said to him, "Look, I would like to uh, create an ESG area inside the company." but they have a sustainability area already. So I think they, they, they need to have this, um, they need to, to have more knowledge about that and to understand how it is related to value creation of the company. And the, 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 the key is um, knowledge and planning process uh, for the companies in the company's levels. In, in terms of the organizations, what I see is that uh, it would be um, a long way if we need to to uh, harmonize or to I think to harmonize the the the, um, the structures we have. Um, I think the 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 easier, but it would be laborious. I know, but the easier challenge is related to the consensus amongst the uh, the, the the organizations. Um, it will take long, but uh, it will be just like IFRS. It came from a long way until it be settled. Um, I think that uh, we still have uh, something that we didn't uh, we didn't um, spoke about in this panel. It's about the cultural um, the culture of business as usual uh, inside the company. So there is a need to change it. Uh, you know, you can have a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, tools. You have uh, harmonized tools, standardized tools, but if you don't change the mentality, mentality, you know, about the economy, you know, uh, it, it will be it will be a solution, but not a complete solution. So, in this part, I would like to uh, paraphrase Kate Raworth. Uh, when she says that a healthy economy should be designed to thrive and not, not only to grow. I think this is the, the, the change in the mindset we need to have. 
Uh, this is what Thank you, you very doing. much, Glossa. I'm so Thank sorry. Thank you very much. No, 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 actually, it's very good. Actually, it's good. We, we went from a broader level to very concrete also experiences. Coming back to you, Nicolas, we are going to be closing now with a round of uh, questions. Uh, from what we heard, I think was fascinating. As I said, I think with each of you, we have a lot of collaboration I think we can do to improve the work we are trying to do with the lab and to support the development uh, of those um, sustainable financial markets. Um, clearly, I think there is a need for convergence. There is efforts being done globally and locally regarding different types of potential for frameworks, impacts, uh, but at the same time, we do need to uh, focus this down to sectors and uh, we have to make it material as well, not only for the issuance of a bond, but obviously that this makes sense also for the companies. And I think what Glaucia ended up on her talk is a good uh, uh, you know, hint for what we, we should be indeed uh, pro improving and promoting you know, thriving. So I, I think from what I'm hearing here, in general, there are two things that I, I would like you all, I will give the, the word for each one of you to react. If we were to think on how can we help to uh, using these different tools that are available, I think a lot of them can be actually uh, uh, pretty complementary, but we also have an array, and I think what Glaucia was saying, of companies that don't know yet very well how they will uh, navigate on that and how they get their management to understand this. This is from one side. On the other side, we also need to promote transparency and perception from the investors that the markets are really going towards sustainability, that there are impacts on what they're investing, that what the investments they are doing is a very good point uh, made by Klaus as well to say it's not good if the company has a beautiful green impact but has corruption issues. No? So how we can have this information? I think there's two things that come out from it. Transparency, how can we promote more transparency in the market? How can we help that, for example, the local stock markets, the regulators like CVM here, uh, the banks, the, the actors in the financial and capital markets can promote some kind of transparency uh, and information about these different standards and how to use them. And the other, very important and related to, and I think has a lot to do with the work of GRI, but also SASB and GRI, on the education and the convening. No? So how can we engage and educate better also investors and issuers to understand the opportunities, take advantage of them, and scale this up? I think there is huge things that came from all of you I would have loved to actually have much more time for conversating, but I wanted to give like a, a, a less round of, of conversation. So maybe starting again, Nicholas, if you can talk five minutes about that, Stacy, Arturo, Marcelo and Glaucia. Uh, Nicholas, with you. Um, thank you very much, Maria. I'll, I'll try, to be, try to be quite summary on this. Um, I think we should distinguish the situation between what is, um, already happened in, in Europe or, or perhaps um, also China vis-a-vis -vis other markets. Uh, because the question of, um, starting perhaps from the end of what you were saying, uh, how can we promote this? Um, we're, we're kind of already there, I would argue, uh, particularly in Europe. Um, and, and this is translating particularly through um, a, a very significant uh, regulatory drive um, so we've moved from just the market to, to the legislative sp you know, space. Uh, we've had discussions for the last um, three years now on the EU Action Plan on Sustainable Finance. Uh, we now have a renewed uh, sustainable finance strategy. We, we've got you know, the, the, the Green New Deal in, 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 in Europe. So um, you know, the whole sort of mainstreaming education, et cetera, uh, has, has happened there. Um, I think, of course, when we go wider afield and we come to, to Latin America and we come to, to, to Brazil, uh, obviously we're not quite um, there yet, but, but I, would, um, I would say that um, the, the, the trend that we're seeing is, is, is a global one. So I'm actually not too concerned about the, the question of, of how do we promote this because 
it is it's promoting itself, <laughs> you know, in in some way. Um, and you know, we've seen a news flow. Uh, again, I, I apologize if I'm being you know European centric. Um, the but a lot of the green bond market, super market is still very much um, um, uh, there, sort of more than 50% of it. You know, when you see the European Commission coming in and saying that it's going to issue 100 billion dollars of social bonds and announcing that it's going to issue 200 billion or 300 billion equivalent of, of green bonds, you, you realize that we've moved into a completely different space now. Um, now we're again we're far from that in in in, in other in other jurisdictions, and hopefully. What is going to happen is that that you know th this will reverberate globally, and you know we will see you know the, the the similar trend. Now, in terms of of ensuring the the, the transparency, I would think that there's both an opportunity and and a danger. Um, the 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 opportunity is to provide the information that that it is that is required by investors. Uh, across the spectrum, so not just, just you know green, but also social, also ESG, taking into account, for example, you know governance or or gender balance, etc. Um, but where the danger is, and we're seeing this um, again in 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 Europe, uh, where we've had proposals to have asked companies to have 52 different metrics. Well, I mean, you can imagine. <laughs> The, the, how this would be received, you know, in your average company, when suddenly, um, you know, they may not have quite finished their their ESG education, and they're being asked to formally by their regulator, you know, report on 52 different metrics. So the the response, you know, that we're providing is, you know, why don't we focus on 10, <laughs> and make those really meaningful, and make it really clear as to what we're asking, and make sure that this is what the investors want, that this is what the issues can produce that they understand, and that you know the intermediaries in the middle can play their role in terms of educating and also ensuring that, you know, all this is gonna, gonna happen. Um, I'll stop there. Excellent point, actually. I think the issue of standardization on the one hand is like, it's important to promote transparency indeed for, for the market, you know, and to monetize also, to be clear that eventually the sustainability has a, an economic value, but you are totally right as well. We have to be very careful uh, in that this doesn't become a science per se. I think uh, one of the points, and that's where we give a lot of value to the lab here, is how can we make it feasible to companies to start doing that without needing to pay thousands of dollars to consultancy firms and having to do very sophisticated assessments. I think partially maybe it comes uh, also from the discussion we had uh, with Artur and Glaucia, you know, that they, they have to probably develop their own ways to do things, but on the regulator side, uh, very good point. You know, we have to be careful on the balance of that. You know? uh, Stacy, from your side, going to the regulator discussion and uh, what would you, you say are things we should try to do with regards to this promoting more transparency, promoting uh, more, let's say, engagement. I like it a bit though, on, the, on the lines of what Nicholas was saying, making it marketable, maybe not that much just engagement from the point of view of understanding that this is important. Right. So, I mean, one thing that's happening in Brazil that you probably are all well aware of is that the central bank and it's in good company with lots of its peer regulators across the world um, is looking into requiring financial institutions to disclose climate related financial information. Um, if that moves forward, those financial institutions will need to in turn talk to companies about getting information they need in order to put out disclosures um, that would address their financial risks. And so I think that is a, is a good place to start in many ways because it's um, regulatory driven, um, but I expect would take a lot of kind of back and forth between investors and companies and the regulators to figure out exactly where to go with it. Um, the other thing that I think is going to drive it and it sort of picks up, I think, what Nicholas was saying to some degree. I do think that with companies that have, or sorry, countries that have signed up for the Paris Agreement, they've committed to move financing flows to areas that are, you know, needed to change in order to move to a, you know, net zero economy, world economy. 
and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is sort of the UN body of experts that really understand this stuff, um, you know, they've talked about three and a half trillion needed per year to move the world to um, newer technologies for energy, changing the infrastructure, all of these things. And that is just massive. And once that starts to take off, I think everybody will be clamoring to understand what information they need to disclose, what information they need to assess. Um, I think obviously that will drive green bonds through the roof. Um, and so I think those things in combination will really push the need for people to understand these issues. Thanks a lot. And actually, that's a very good point. I think the fact that we and have regulators actually moving, uh, I think is a huge, huge uh, impact in the markets. It doesn't need to be a top-down standard, but just the signals like the case of the central bank and CBME here is, is, is super important. Uh, Arturo, I don't know what is a bit you're taking now, so more from the one-to-one uh, -one kind of work you have been trying to do with the companies. Uh, sure. So um, back to this idea of, of, of transparency, I, I, I think I, I, I can summarize that in three drivers, right? There's the market-driven transparency, and, and we have examples of that in Latin America. Just last week, uh, 80 uh, institutional investors and uh, capital market participants in Mexico signed a a letter asking companies to report on SASB and TCFD. And these investors and, and organizations represent 25% of Mexico's uh, GDP. So that's the market driven uh, example in Latin America. There's of course the regulatory driven um, push by uh, regulators like in, in Brazil, CB, CBM and in Chile, uh, for example, uh, uh, examples in the region uh, where, where things are being pushed by, by regulators. And of course, we as an ecosystem of, of uh, sustainability reporting information need to do a better job in uh, describing how all of these organizations fit together uh, in a complementary and additive way. And uh, to that effect, uh, most of, I guess, uh, some of you know that uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, several organizations, including uh, for SASB, CDP, CDESB, uh, GRI, and Integrated Reporting, released a publication in which we um, uh, describe a, uh, our, our work plan to be to simplify uh, how these pieces fit together. Uh, and also, uh, we, in that publication, we also set a joint vision on how um, using our different standards and things those are the main three drivers uh, that are pushing transparency uh, across the world, not only uh, in Europe or Latin America or the U.S., but uh, you see that in, in different uh, levels in different markets. Uh, but it's important to, to um, for us as, as the ecosystem to uh, clearly communicate how all these pieces fit together and uh, communicate also that we're working together to simplify uh, reporting standards because uh, to, to echo what um, Claudia was saying, it took decades for the IF, IFRS to, to be developed, right? And sustainability reporting and sustainability transparency is relatively new uh, in the context of, of uh, or, or vis a vis financial reporting. So we're working closely together to, to create a, a common message and a common understanding of how all these pieces fit together to improve transparency. That's great news, Arturo. And then just to, you know, let, to let you know, we are really uh, IDB here to support. And I think we could have good conversations on seeing how we could maybe even pilot this kind of uh, convergence uh, pilots of uh, efforts on some of our countries, including Brazil and Mexico. But I think the laboratory here in Brazil also is an excellent space for that. So let's talk about that because I think these are the concrete things we could start doing and, and you know, trying to support uh, these local dialogues and this kind of efforts of the different standards to work together is extremely important. No? Uh, uh, on a market, as you all are saying, 
it will come. Uh, I think as Casey is right, he, and I'm not sure if it's for good reasons, because unfortunately, climate change is going to happen. We will see need for more social engagement because of crises like COVID. But independent of that, I think we need to help the players in the market to be able to navigate you know, uh, uh, on this. And uh, if, if I may just add something real quick. Yes, please, uh, of course. To Marcelo's point of, of uh, the, the comment on uh, one size fits all, we at SAS we recognized, uh, again, back to this idea of um, nested materiality and the different use cases of uh, information, ESG information, that no single organization, either a standard or framework, can satisfy the needs of all the market, right? Uh, we need to collaborate. So it, it is really important that the corporations and investors understand that we as uh, standard setters and frameworks of sustainability information are trying to collaborate uh, to satisfy uh, in a building block manner the needs of the different players uh, and the different actors that want and need and crave this type of uh, information. Thank you very much Arturo. We are going to be bothering you much more on that. Uh, Marcelo, if you wanted to take a bit the floor, and uh, I would be interested if you can focus a bit on Brazil since you are playing a big role there. Yeah, and well, actually I uh, would like to, to second what Nicola said. Uh, here in Brazil, we, we, are, we don't have to promote the, the agenda because uh, as you know, uh, uh, we, if we have like, if we consider that the, the number of signatories in Brazil as a proxy of an indicator on how much uh, the, the sustainability, financial sustainability is, is growing in Brazil, we, we are, uh, are going about like 30% number in the number of, of more than 30% in the number of, number of signatories in Brazil. So uh, this is only an example. And, and also uh, the, the, the growth that we have had in Brazil is, is, very, uh, is, is a very di diversified kind of, kind of growth with, with different assets, some of them more concentrated in the, in the retail uh, sector and and a, a very good mix of of signatories in Brazil. So this is the right momentum, and I think uh, the PRI also has a very uh, important responsibility on trying to to help uh, build capacity of this uh, on these uh, uh, investors. So we've been trying to uh, educate investors uh, on, for example, uh, last month we had a, a webinar on taxonomy, and uh, last month. We also had a, 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 a round table on, on uh, TCFD. So I, I think it's very important to, to grow, but it's important to grow in, a, in an organized way. Of course, we have uh, had the, the, the issue of green, greenwashing. And I think, you know, I, I think Europe uh, has had the same problem and still ha has uh, the same problem. But uh, I believe that uh, when we uh, uh, start to harmonize our local taxonomy with the European taxonomy, uh, this is going to be a, a landmark uh, here in Brazil. And hopefully, the taxonomy uh, should, will uh, uh, be absorbed by um, uh, an auto regulatory framework or hopefully in a regulatory framework. So this is something that Vasco <laughs> who uh, can help us uh, implementing because I do think that uh, regula regulations uh, is important. We, ha we just had the same, uh, 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 an example with the, with the banking uh, system. The, the central bank announced the, that the, uh, from, uh, from in, in two, I think two years time, uh, uh, financial institutions will have to report using the uh, TCFD uh, framework. So I think this is very, very important, and and uh, and we th I think we have to uh, to put efforts, the, 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 you know, most of our efforts to to make this happen in and happen in a very uh, organized way. And again, uh, in, it's just to come back to the to the uh, harmonization issue, I think it's very important, of course, as as Arturo mentioned, to put on the on the same uh, uh, table. Uh, the standard setters, the corporate associations such as the World Business Council sustainable, or for sustainable development uh, to discuss 
and and of course the initiatives uh, that represent regulatory and supervisory agencies like IOSCO and uh, the PRI representing the, the the investor. So it has to be a collective uh, movement. Otherwise, I don't think we'll have uh, we'll will be succeed. Uh, we will succeed in this in this uh, initiative. But I, I'm very positive that doing this collectively and without bias, I think it will will get there. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia. Some last words from your side as well. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, just to uh, to complete what uh, uh, Marcelo was, say, was saying, compliment. Uh, uh, the harmonization discussion is already happening, and Arturo also mentioned that. So this is the good news. Um, I think that it's important for us to think about reliability of the information. So it's important for us to discuss assurance or audit process. Yes. So, uh, this is, uh, because today, when you hire somebody to make your ESG report uh, assurance, uh, it's a limited uh, assurance, which is almost nothing, and it's very expensive. You know, the result is is almost zero, but it is expensive. And I think that a discussion about assurance, because for me in the future, I see a financial audit, audit process already asking ESG information, the connection between that value created with the ESG um, uh, values that the the, the company um, work it on, and um, I think that in terms of um, how to spread that, I, I would like to mention a, a good example: it the the electricity facility um, sector in Brazil. They regulated about disclosure since uh, 2001, first with IBASI, then after with the GRI. And then uh, if we could see a result of that, if we take the sustainability index from B3, there are a lot of uh, electricity facility companies in there. So it's a, maybe a, an example of how regulation could um, push this discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a very rich conversation, as I said. I think you, with each of you, I think we could have uh, um, uh, many hours actually of conversation. And uh, really from the IDB CVM side, we want to keep here the commitment that we want to continue collaborating with you. Also on the, the laboratory we are promoting in Brazil with the financial markets. Uh, the points you ended up with, uh, Glaucia, are important, as well as you know, promoting to the markets how to use these standards and making it navigable, no possible for the companies to navigate and use. As important as that is, you are totally right. We also need to have assurance of the quality of those actions. No, and I think we were still a bit, I think, on both sides away from that. I, I agree, and I think we have now more and more knowledge of the importance of the uh, sustainability, but it's still a lot of confusion no, uh, from companies, from investors on how to move on that. Uh, I think these efforts that all of you are doing now uh, to try to harmonize and organize together is important. The messaging from the regulators is extremely important as well, but we need to find ways to probably support still the markets to understand better what the options are, how they can navigate and use different standards uh, adequate to their sectors and situations as well. I think come also from a very interesting conversation at the beginning already with Nicholas on the need for considering social in the, in the scheme. So green social is not two different things. We should probably consider more and more how we manage this sustainable agenda in a joint way. Uh, but also this issue of the reliability, the, the way to verify. Uh, from IDB side also, as Morgan said at the very beginning, we have uh, an initiative regionally in Latin America, the Green Bond Transparency Platform. The platform today is focusing on green because the bonds, uh, thematic bonds market at the beginning were mainly on green, but we do see increasingly the need also to start looking at the sustainable aspect. Uh, but even on the green, I think the lessons learned we are seeing from there 
uh, and I think I learned a lot today as, as well with you, is this need to consider uh, beyond just the framework of impact, what all the, uh, the, the investors and issuers are looking for in terms of positioning themselves in this sustainable arena, be it from the governance side, be it from the material, uh, let's say, impact, how they are changing their behavior over time, how they link the green and social aspects to their own business, um, but also how we assure that when we say we're going in the right direction, and I like it the more the words of Blauser, we are thriving. No, so I, I want to close here. Uh, thanking so much each of you for your time. This uh, we know some of you are talking from other countries. Uh, we know that's not always easy to make time for us to be here. As Morgan said at the very beginning of this session, we will have the information in a link here for uh, everybody to see it. Uh, the IDB for sure is going to be promoting this, but we'll also be promoting this to uh, throughout the lab and CBMI, so and IOSCO. So uh, for us, it's also a pleasure to be closing with that. The work we did during this World Investor Week, I think. Uh, could not have been nicer than this uh, panel for us to be closing our series of events. And uh, I, uh, without no more issues, I want to thank you and say goodbye and see you soon. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.